song that we're about to sing is a beautiful song. It just has five verses to it. And the problem is you can't leave any of the verses out because this story is the gospel. You're singing the gospel. You're starting out with the birth of Jesus Christ and you finish up with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are just being able, fortunate and blessed to be able to sing the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think the title of it has a message in itself, one day. That's what we're looking for, one day, Amen. when Jesus Christ comes and takes his jewels home. Join us as we sing this precious gospel song.
remain standing with your Bibles open to the book of Revelation, chapter 13, and this is one of those portions of Scripture that we just have to kind of cut in on uh, what is written. But these are precious words, important words for all of us today, and this is what the Scripture has to say. By the way, at some point, if you would uh, mark your Bible to the book of 2 Thessalonians, and we'll be uh, going uh, back there for a bit just later. And he calls all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred threescore and six, or six sixty-six. Father, we bow in grateful heart this morning in your presence, thanking you for the privilege and the honor and the joy of being together with people of like faith. But the joy above all joys is the fact that we know Jesus Christ as our Savior. We have invited him into our heart. Our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but we know that is not true for everyone. And we pray that the day may hasten to come when anyone who has not made that decision will do so because it is our goal this morning, it is our desire to make very clear to everyone who hears what awaits them if they do not make their commitment to Jesus Christ as their Savior. Thank you for the joys that we have, the pleasure, the blessings that we receive from you day by day, moment by moment. And now we come to worship, but what we really are here is to lift up, glorify, and magnify the precious, loving, and saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Be seated if you would. Thank you and bless you for being a part of our worship time this morning. It is just a joy to be in the Lord's house with his people always. From the moment this service is over, I can tell you that I'll take some downtime this afternoon, and that will usually involve a recliner. And uh, I'll take some downtime tomorrow. But even then, my mind is already looking forward to next Sunday. Uh, most weeks, when I'm sharing a message with you, I kind of have an idea where the Lord is leading for the following week. And so this is a most important message. Very important. Very important that you know that you understand, and granted, the book of Revelation is not uh, a book that is easily understood, but it is one that the Lord has pleased to reveal to us some precious truth that we need to know, and we're going to sort out a part of that this morning for your understanding, and really what the apostles said, for our edification, to build us up in our faith. We welcome you this morning. If you're joined by Facebook, YouTube, we are so grateful that you've chosen to be a part of our extended church. And as opportunity comes, we pray that you'll join us here uh, to worship in the Lord's house together. I just have to tell you that the last three years, as you know, has not been easy for anyone, and certainly not for the church. Uh, it's been a challenging time. Uh, we've had to eliminate some things. Uh, we've had to change some things. And I just 
believe that right now we're finding our way back. I think it's been that long, and I see the Lord doing some things that uh, are just evident that uh, we have gotten past that very difficult time in the life of the church. And I just want you to keep praying with me that the Lord will continue uh, to bless the church, that He'll continue to lead us to do whatever we need to do. And uh, by the way, you will see three ministry opportunities in your bulletin this morning. Actually, there are four. Uh, we will plan to resume Sunday school on the 20th of August. We will have a baptismal service the same afternoon. We will have a homecoming in uh, September, and we will have uh, volunteers. You've been asked if you would like to minister through the nursery. Uh, that is a ministry that now uh, we're focusing on. So obviously we can only provide that with adult supervision. So thank you for being in prayer and being faithful as we move forward as the Lord leads us uh, to be a witness in this community and throughout the world. I do believe the title of this song is really the heart of what I just said. God leads us along. He really does. We're following his leading. Just beep in prayer as the Sanctuary Choir shares this message. And if I may add a fifth ministry opportunity, the choir took the month of July off from uh, worship choir practice, but we're going to resume Wednesday evening, and we love to have new members. So if you uh, love to sing, Maybe you can't sing by yourself, but I'm telling you, when you get with a group like this, you sound wonderful. We'd love to share God Leads Us Along this morning.
Thank you, Sanctuary Choir, for leading us in this part of our worship time. And by the way, I overlooked the fact of telling you that Wednesday we'll be resuming Bible study here in the sanctuary. So we've taken a break as the choir did, and uh, Wednesday evening we'll be back uh, worshiping together, studying together. When the Apostle Paul wrote two letters to the church at Thessalonica, he used a lot of one-liners, uh, just statements that were very brief, and maybe one thing didn't have anything to do with the other except that it applied to the Christian life, such as in the fifth chapter of his first letter, he said, uh, rejoice evermore, and then pray without ceasing. Quench not the spirit. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, pray for us. And so these are things that are easy to read and easy to remember. But in both of his letters, he addressed a subject that obviously was a matter of great concern and should have been to that church because apparently there were false teachers in the area and more specifically in the church who were concerned about the fact that their loved ones uh, may not be in the rapture and uh, they may have then they may be left behind. And in his first letter in chapter 4, he said this, words that we've used many times in a memorial service, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the voice, with the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It was, some have said, the apostle was basically saying, if you are ever concerned about your loved ones missing the rapture, just look at the cemetery. As long as the graves are closed, 
you know the Lord has not returned. I'm not so sure about that. And I'll tell you why. I don't really know that the Lord has to open a grave to take out those who are, he said three times, asleep in the Lord. I, if I understand correctly, when the Lord came out of the tomb, the stone was rolled away, but it wasn't rolled away to let him out. It was rolled away to let the disciples in. And so we understand today that the Lord did appear and disappear among his disciples after his resurrection. He could enter a room without opening the door. And so he was not limited by time or space. And we won't be either. But nonetheless, we do believe that the next major event on God's calendar is the rapture of the church. Now the word rapture is not used in the Bible, but it says that we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And that word means several things. First of all, it means to take out by force. It means to rescue from danger. And so with that being said, I want to tell you that the next major event on God's calendar is going to be the rapture, the catching up, the taking out of the church that is made up of everyone who has professed saving faith in Jesus Christ and has put your name, let the Lord write your name in the Lamb's book of life. That being true, I want us to be abundantly clear about something else. What follows after the church is caught up is something you do not want to be a part of. You don't want to be here. There's going to be a time of tribulation. And that, by the way, was one of the things that misled the people of that church. Because the Lord talked about the tribulation. In fact, he said, in this world, you'll have tribulation. But what I'm talking about and what the scripture is talking about after the church is caught up is the fact that there is going to be great tribulation. Some have said that there's a seven-year period, and it is from the record of the Scripture. There's a seven-year period after the church is taken up of great of tribulation, great tribulation. And some have said, well, the first three and a half years are just tribulation. The last three are going to be great tribulation. Mark it down any way you want. You do not want to be a part of it. Now, let me be abundantly clear about my position on this. I know you're going to hear teachings that the church is going through the tribulation. I know you're going to hear that. That's just part of the teaching that is out there. You believe what you want. But I'm telling you, I don't want to be a part of that. And I don't plan to be a part of it. And as far as I'm concerned, God has already set the precedent to tell us exactly what he's going to do and how he's going to do it. He did that at the time of the flood. Pastor, what are you talking about? How did he do that? The ark was taken up. Noah and his family, the saved people, the only saved people in the ark, were taken up with the flood. The flood waters came. The ark came back to the earth. One day, the church is going to be caught up. There's going to be a time of tribulation, seven years to be exact, and then we're coming back to the earth with our Lord. The scripture says, and so shall we ever be with our Lord. Where he goes, we go. When he goes up, we're going up. And when he comes back, we're coming back. There's going to be a thousand year reign of Christ on earth. And during that time, Satan will be bound in the bottomless pit. But we're not going there today. We're just telling you that when, just as Noah was safe in the ark, and here's another one. The city of Sodom could not be destroyed until Lot got out of there. Fire from heaven could not come down and consume the city of Lot, a, a city of Sodom, until Lot was taken out of there. The scripture, is, as far as I am concerned, is abundantly clear. And by the way, when Paul wrote to this same church, he said to them, praise God for Jesus Christ, who has delivered us from the wrath to come. 
What do you think he was talking about? My mind, he was talking about exactly what I'm telling you. The time that is going to follow the catching up, the taking away of the church. The scripture is very clear. We are looking more every day. With every passing day, with every passing year, it looks like the church is ripe for the rapture. I'm going to tell you straight up, I pray for revival. I pray for revival. But I understand something. Revival is for the church. That's what the scripture wants us to do. You join me, will you not? Will you join me in praying for revival? After the last three and a half years when Satan has kind of had his way with things, it's time for us now to bind our hearts together and pray for revival. And yes, I pray for revival in this country. I pray for revival in America. But I just have to be honest with you. I don't believe it's going to happen. And the reason I say, I know it can, God can do a lot of things. Say, Pastor, why are you praying if you don't think it's going to happen? Make no mistake about it. Nobody has ever seen society in the mess it is in today. Not ever. In the 20th century, every generation is worse than the one they followed. We're seeing things in this world today that we never heard of as a child. Simply not. We're seeing people being openly, and the scripture talks about no shame, no shame whatsoever. And so, make no mistake about it. But here's the thing. The scripture says in 2 Thessalonians, that second chapter, for the, verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. With that in mind, let me tell you what he said. Right now, there is, there is a flood of evil just waiting in the wings. And I'm telling you, one day the levee is going to break because the church is going to be taken up. Let me tell you, you go ahead, people of the world. You go ahead, wicked, demonic followers, and bash us all you want. But I'm telling you this, you're going to miss us when we're gone. Make no mistake about it. Because right now, the Holy Spirit working through the church are the levees that are holding back all of the evil. When the Lord comes and takes the church home, the floodgates are going to be gone. They're going to be open. And this world is going to see wickedness like it has never seen before. As bad as it is, and as bad as it may get, it's never going to be nothing compared to what's going to happen on this world when the church is taken out. We are the restraining force. We are the levies that are holding back all of the evil in this world today. And so, just so you know, when it comes to the end time, you may be surprised to know this, you may be surprised to hear this, but check the record. America does not figure to be a player in the end time. All of the action is going to be focused on the countries in the Middle East. And I'll tell you about that in just a moment. But the scripture is abundantly clear that when the church is taken up, somebody is going to rise to be the head of everything, to be the object of worship, Somebody is going to rise up to imitate the presence of Jesus Christ. In fact, they are going to desire to be everything that Jesus Christ has always been. The object of devotion and worship. Make no mistake about it.
The question is, and John, by the way, says, in, in fact, John is the only one who uses the name Antichrist. I don't see it in the book of Revelation. It talks about him. We know it's making reference to the Antichrist. And by the way, anti can mean two things. It can mean against, but it can also mean in place of. And so you do recall that Lucifer was expelled from heaven because he wanted to take the place of God. He wanted to be number one. He was not content to be number two. But John says the spirit of the Antichrist is already in the world. And it is. You can see what's going on here. Who do you think is behind all of the horrible things that are taking place in the world today? Who do you think is behind all of the sin? Certainly not our Lord. It is none other than the, than the Satan having his way. But he doesn't have complete and unlimited sovereignty over the world. He just doesn't. And so the scripture then is, says there's going to be one who will come. He's going to assert himself. The question is, who is the Antichrist? If you keep in mind, the Lord has been gone from us for 2,000 years. And so we don't know who the Antichrist will be. And Satan can't know who the Antichrist will be because he would have to have somebody on the scale, on the scape throughout those 2,000 years ready to move in. Kenneth Weiss, in his commentary, says he believes that the Antichrist is going to be none other than Judas because Judas was called the son of perdition. The Antichrist is called, first of all, the man of sin. And he is. He is the one who knows nothing but sin, who promotes nothing but sin. A few years ago, there was a movie that came out entitled The Last Temptations of Christ. The chairman of the board of the company that produced that film was a man whose last name was Wasserman. He was a Jew. That movie showed our blessed Lord in the most horrible light you could possibly imagine. It pictured him having sex with Mary Magdalene. It had him saying, I am afraid. I am a devil. Just hor all, horrible things all the way through. The sad part about it, and you should not be surprised, the world flocked to the theaters to see, it, see this. Christians protested, and well, they should have. The interesting thing is that when that movie came out, you would have thought that God would have nipped it in the bud. He would have done something. But this is what our Lord is doing. He is letting Satan have just so much rope. And one day, he will literally hang himself. But for now, I want to tell you, whoever this Antichrist may be, and by the way, one of the reasons they believe it is Judas is because the scripture says he went to his own place. And G. Campbell Morgan says Judas didn't go to Hades or Sheol. He went to the bottomless pit where the spirit, the souls of certain evil ones are being held. And one day, by the way, Satan will be bound in the bottomless pit. And one angel, by the way, will put him there. And he'll be there for a thousand years. We will have a thousand years of peace on earth. Get ready for that. But we'll be coming back with our Lord. And just so you know, everything that we know about the Antichrist, he is a smooth talker. 
He is a commanding talker. He is, at some point, he will be a demanding talker. He will enforce his will. He is somebody who has a lot of charisma. He is a man of a lot of intellect. And so he is a man who is very deceitful in everything that he says, very smooth talking, but very deceitful in everything that he says. As a matter of fact, the scripture uses seven words for deceive, and the one that applies to the Antichrist is wholly deceitful. There's not an ounce of truth in his bones or in his body. Not ever, not ever. And so, the best we understand, he's going to enter into a treaty with the people of Israel, a seven-year treaty. That will last for about three and a half years, after which time there are going to be some changes that are going to take place. Let me tell you as best I can in a short capsule what that will be. You do know that in 1967, after the Six-Day War, the people of Israel, the Jews, came back and took their city back. They now claim ownership of the Temple Mount. But for all these years, they have not rebuilt the temple. The reason being, Islam claims to, that that is their site. And so, in order to prevent an all-out war, they have not attempted to rebuild that temple. But according to the scripture in the book of Revelation, Satan, the Antichrist, is going to make an agreement with the people of Israel to rebuild a temple. And by the way, he will do it because the scripture says he's going to be sitting in the temple demanding that people worship him. And not only will we be sitting in the temple, everything that we understand from the book of Revelation, and you read that in the chapter that we made reference to this morning, everything that you read, it appears that he is going to have a giant statue made in his image. Just like Nebuchadnezzar, who had one, what, that baby was what, 90 feet tall? And he demanded that everybody bow down and worship that, and that image, worship that statue. And so, just so you'll know, there will come a time when the Arabs in the area will be a little bit shy about doing anything with the nation of Israel. But there will come a time when Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 is going to come to life. It's still there, and it's going to happen. The nation of Russia is going to form an alliance with the surrounding Arab nation, and they are going to make war against Israel. It's a good possibility that Japan, that China will be joining forces with them. But this we know, the moment they set foot on the land of Israel, God is going to intervene. And there is going to be a battle that is the granddaddy of all battles. God is going to fight for Israel. And those who come against his people are going to be doomed. And I do mean doomed. With that in mind, by this time, the Antichrist will decide he doesn't need the people of Israel anymore. He'll set up his kingdom. He will do what he needs to do. He is called the man of sin. He is called the man of perdition. Perdition. The word perdition means destructive. There is not anything constructive 
in any plan that he has. There's nothing he is going to do that is going to be for the best interest or the welfare of the people under his rule. He is a man who will destroy everybody, body, soul, and spirit. And that is exactly what it means. Oh, by the way, he will be performing miracles. Make no mistake about it. Don't be misled. Don't be drawn into a state of delusion. He is going to perform miracles. He can do that today. Be careful about miracles because that will be something that he will do. And by the way, the Antichrist will be empowered by who else but Satan. And so these are a dangerous team. Make no mistake about it. But there's something you need to know. There are going to be people who are going to be saved during the tribulation period. Say, so, well, Pastor, if that's true, then I'll just wait. If the Lord catches the church up, I'll go through the tribulation period. And if I can be saved, then I'll be saved there. No, you won't. Because if you had the opportunity to be saved now, you'll not get it then. But here's the bigger thing. If you won't accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior right now, when it is relatively easy to do that, you don't live in a country where they will persecute you and even kill you because of your faith. You don't live in a country where you may very well lose your job by professing faith in Jesus Christ. You don't live in a country for your family will flat out disown you if you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you won't trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, and by the way, we are in the age of grace. And when the church is taken out, that age of grace is over. Make no mistake about it. If you won't trust Christ as your Savior right now, what makes you think that you're going to accept Him as your Savior later on when it will invariably cost you your life? It has been suggested that there are probably as many as millions of people who will trust the Lord, who will be saved, but it will invariably cost them their lives. And we'll tell you more about that in just a moment. But make no mistake about it. The Lord has in the book of Revelation two witnesses that the scripture said cannot be killed. They will be slain their bodies will be in the street for three days and everybody will shout hallelujah. Look at them, they died. But then they will invariably, miraculously be resurrected. Not only that, but the scripture says the Lord will have 144,000 sealed Jews to share the gospel during the tribulation period. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. And I heard it said once in explaining about the 144,000 that, first of all, this is heaven on earth. Friend, I'm going to tell you what. If you want to believe that, you need to have another cup of coffee because that is, if you think this is heaven on earth, I want no part of that. I know John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth coming down out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And so... I'm telling you, they've said this is heaven on earth, and when the time is right, we're going to knock on heaven's door and tell that 144,000 to come down here and join us. Nonsense. That simply is not. They are the 144,000 sealed Jews who cannot be killed. They will be witnesses for our God. And by the way, they will do in a relatively short time what the church hasn't done in all of these 2,000 years. Win this world. Get the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's what they will do. And so, here's what you, we read in the book of Revelation this morning. When you find yourself an unbeliever, and by the way, if you trusted Christ, you can just look over your shoulder and pray that your family and your loved ones come to know the Lord as their Savior, or if not, they're going to be subjected to this. 
They're going to have to receive the mark of the beast in their forehead or in, in their forehead or in their hand. I do know my forehead from my hand, by the way, just so you know. They're going to have to receive the mark of the beast. The number 666. Tell me if everything now isn't pointing in that direction. There are pe- places today that will not accept cash. They won't. Everything is pointing in that direction. And so those who will not accept the mark of the beast will not be able to buy, sell, or trade. And there won't be any black market. And so for those who lose their lives because they have trusted Christ as their Savior, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be executed. They can lose their lives simply because they don't have the mark of the beast in their hand or in their foot, and they cannot buy or sell anything to eat or drink. And therefore, it is not unreasonable to think that they one day will starve to death. The Antichrist is not going to have any part of it. Make no mistake about it. He's going to assert himself in the temple. He's going to demand that people worship him. And he will absolutely control the world as no, as no one has ever controlled it before. But get this. The scripture said it, does it not? In verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Oh, by the way, he's going to be, make no mistake about it, he's going to be gifted with signs and lying wonders. But don't be misled for a moment. I just want you to know right now that Jesus Christ is coming back. You got that? Jesus Christ is coming back. And we're going out of here in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And this is what I want you to know. Listen to me. Hear it. You trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. He will write your name in the Lamb's book of life. It will be there forever. And when judgment day comes, you will be having your reservation already taken care of. Because your name is in the Lamb's book of life. And by the way, those who don't, those who don't have their name there, when they stand at the great white throne, judgment, That book will be there. The book of life and the books that record their works. And if they want to put up any protest, I'm not supposed to be here. I made my profession of faith way back when. The book, the land book of life will be open and your name will not be in it. If you don't accept Jesus Christ as your savior, your name will not be in the book of life. And if you don't, when the church is gone and you'll be left behind, you're going to have to take the mark in your hand or in your forehead. And if you don't, if you do, you will invariably be persecuted. And if you don't, You're going to lose either way. You're going to lose either way. And so here's what I want you to know. Either Jesus Christ has your name or the Antichrist has your number. 
What's it going to be? What is it going to be? Jesus Christ has my name. I put it in the Lamb's Book of Life. No, he put it in the Lamb's Book of Life. And he wrote it there, and it cannot be erased. It will never be erased. And I'm telling you, you either have his name, your name, in the Lamb's Book of Life, or Satan, the Antichrist, has your number. You make the decision. You make that decision today. As our worship leaders come, I want to share an invitation with you. And I want to tell you, this is a solemn moment. I'm going to share something with you that may be a bit humorous. But what I'm telling you is not a joke at all. When we were at the beach for our family time, we took pictures. Oh, great day, we took pictures. We got pictures all over the place. We got pictures of everybody. And uh, our granddaughter sent comp uh, pictures off of the computer or whatever to pharmacy, and uh, we got them from there. As I looked through them, uh, there were several interesting ones, and I could bring them, and I can take up the service one Sunday just showing you pictures. Uh, I, they didn't really take a lot of me. Well, they did too, but uh, they should have taken a lot more, I think, but they, they didn't do that. But they did take one picture that I thought stood out among others. Andy, do you have that to bring it up? Here it is. That's our great-grandson, Everett. Everett is being catapulted into the air by his Uncle James. When I saw that picture, what has captured my attention about it is he looks like he's flying. His arms are out, his legs are back behind him. As you can see, the water there is five feet deep. And James said after about three times of that, ever decide no more of this. He got tired of being shot out of a cannon. <laughs> and so when I looked at that, I thought, wow, this is amazing how somebody can be suspended in midair with their arms out, their legs back. And what I thought about, you know where I'm going with this, when I saw that, is when the Lord comes, what are we going to have? How are we going to get out of here? I don't know that I'm going to have any wings, but I'm telling you this. We're going to sing the chorus, not for the invitation, but we're going to sing the chorus, I'll fly away. And I do know this, when the Lord comes, it's not going to be a long, drawn-out process. He thinks you're here, he thinks you're there. Paul said, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, quicker than a wink, you would be out of here. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we should all be changed. When the Lord comes, we're going out of here. And picture yourself being suspended in midair, somewhere between earth and heaven. But knowing this, that whether you have any wings or not, you won't have to worry about a parachute. You won't need one because we're going but one way, up, up, and up. Up, up, and away, and we're out of here. And I'm telling you, it all depends on whether your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Either Jesus has your name or the Antichrist has your number. I hope you'll choose the name. I hope you will decide this morning, I don't want the number. I want nothing to do with it. A lot of things you may not understand, and rightly so, about what happens when the church is out of here. I've just tried to share from my heart and from God's Word something about the Antichrist. That's only a part of it. But you can be sure that you're not here by giving your heart to Jesus Christ. As we sing this song, would you stand together and join us because this is your moment. This is your time. Make sure that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life as we sing. When the 
trumpet of the Lord shall sound. celebrate together for every decision that anyone makes. And the thing that we have to remember, the scripture says there's joy in the presence of angels over one who comes to know the Lord as their Savior. And so from that, we gather that it's Jesus Christ who celebrate every time somebody comes to saving faith in him, and rightly so. And he leads the celebration of others, including those of us in the church today. I want to introduce you to Kyle Crasshorn. Kyle and, and I had the opportunity to talk and she'd expressed an interest in trusting Christ as her savior. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. Amen. And this morning she's followed uh, the Lord's instructions, not really mine, but his. I'm just passing on what he said that if you're going to be a believer, you've got to let people know. You've got to make it public. You can't have anything secret about it. Uh, you can't be ashamed of it, not at all. And so Kyle has come this morning to publicly profess her faith in Jesus Christ and to express a desire to follow him in baptism. It was my privilege and my honor to uh, have the joy of knowing that Kyle's father-in-law, uh, Steve, was the first one to make a profession of faith in my ministry. So I kind of feel like things, uh, I think I'm getting old, uh, <laughs> but, but nonetheless. And so she has come, and it was my honor to perform the marriage ceremony for Kyle and Justin. I'm just so happy for you this morning, Kyle. And you have just made this church uh, a place of rejoicing. And not only that, but they're celebrating all over heaven this morning because you've made this decision. And by the way, along with this, it would be enough if she just said, I want to accept Christ as my savior. And by the way, she just put her name in that book. That's exactly what she did. And, yeah. But in our conversation together, Kyle expressed to me a desire 
to minister. She wants to know what she can do, what she can serve in the church. And I just think that is a testimony in itself. And Kyle, you will find out what many others have found out. Don't ever tell the pastor you want to do something. Uh, so, uh, I'm so happy for you because this is just a moment of joy for all of us. After we are dismissed, I would ask you to take the time to come and share your joy with Kyle and just to let her know that you'll be praying for her in her new walk with the Lord now that she has her name in the book. She won't have to worry about the number. Father, thank you today in Jesus' name for the presence, power, and the working of your spirit. Thank you, Father, that you are countering everything that Satan tries to do. And we know that Satan may be powerful, but only God is all-powerful. Thank you today for demonstrating that and for just bringing Kyle to the place where she has trusted the Lord as her Savior and is looking forward to serving him and just being a witness and a testimony. We thank you, Father, today in Jesus' loving name as we come together, worship together for the presence of your Spirit. In the name of our loving Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Justin and family would like to be the first to come and greet Kyle and, and wish her your best. I know you would. You come and we ask others to follow. And what else can we say as we are dismissed this morning except thank God for Kyle. Thank God for Kyle. Amen. 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 Amen.